Welcome everybody to a brand new episode of the James D Podcast 1991 Retrospective where we review albums that are turning 30 in the year of our Lord 2021. This week we're talking about, you know what, I'm just going to hand this fucking over to Tyler straight the fuck away because I'm just going to put all my cards on the table here. Never fucking heard of this band, never fucking heard of this album before this retrospective, so... Uh, look, as much as, I, as much as I appreciate the handover to me, I in turn will hand over to August because August is the person who put this Teenage Fan Club album into the ah, retrospective. Uh, yeah. This is August's addition to the series. And so I think August, you're the best person who's most equipped to discuss uh, what this album is, who this band are, and why you think it's worth talking about in the 1991 retrospective. All right. So Teenage Fan Club are a Scottish band who got their startup in Glasgow in 1989. And they emerged from the kind of C86 cassette scene, which other bands like Primal Scream also emerged from notably. And this, these were like compilation cassette tapes of various underground artists that would slowly get them. That would like, you know, some of these artists would catch on others wouldn't and this band i think is fascinating for their place in pop culture a because of just in this early period of their career how ridiculously prolific they they were i mean 1991 was their third year of existence and bandwagon-esque is hence their third album mm-hmm. and what is most interesting about Bandwagon-esque is its status as this kind of critical darling album. For context, this is kind of a an alternative rock kind of noise pop, power pop band, very much taking a lot of the stylistic ideas of a group like Big Star and modernizing them for the 90s. Now an aesthetic that itself has been modernized Mm-hmm. by a bunch of artists yeah uh what makes this album notable is it was a critical darling as i said famously uh beating out Nevermind in spin magazine's best albums of the year placing at number one that's right so Damn. i think that is that it's in it of itself is enough of a reason to cover this but what i think is also critically important to why this record needs to be addressed in the 1991 retrospective is its relatively novel sound for the time it's and its unique range of influences uh this this one's for morgan because this is uh one mr benjamin gibbard's favorite album of all time no Uh, shit that's it's huh. interesting. And yeah, to the yeah, to the point say, where he has a whole ben album Truman. covering it. Hmm. And I think the, another reason why I'm glad you added this to the retrospective is that we've covered a, we try to try to cover this broad swath of like what was musically interesting and culturally present in 1991. And one thing we kind of haven't really talked about that much, I guess we kind of, you could say that a record like Out of Time might be fit, might have fit into this, but we've not really talked about indie rock, which to be fair, didn't really like become, a th- well, like, it was hadn't really quite crystallized into this like whole scene and movement at quite at this point in the early 90s. It would in the, in the years immediately to come. But you did have a number of bands around this time. And we're going to talk about another band who are influential in a different sort of way next week when we talk about My Bloody Valentine. But you had an amalgam of various bands and these kind of various kind of guises of alternative rock that were kind of moving away from where a lot of rock typically was and were doing things in a more lo-fi way that was really laying the groundwork for a big bubbling cultural rise in this particular kind of indie rock sphere and teenage fan club i think and this record in particular are sort of a key stepping stone towards that place and absolutely I, yeah, I think so. I think it's important to discuss for that reason. I think, August, your point about the sort of C86 roots. I mean, this is a Scottish band. Scotland has produced a lot of great indie bands, actually, that both in the modern era and in the sort of classic era. So it's cool to get to talk about one of them. 
Um, We've covered two of them in the past. <laughs> Not have, the James and T podcast covering the Scots. Yeah, exactly. Unheard so, of. So that's that's really cool. And you mentioning the kind of relationship between this and you know the C eighty six stuff of like Primal Screen, for instance, quite different, more sort of psychedelic, but not a million miles away from other sort of Manchester adjacent stuff like the Stone Roses, for instance. And yeah, the, except infused with that real power pop aspect. And you're, of course, right to bring up Big Star, probably the most definitive influence on this record, oh, yeah. even if this is a much more kind of a very sort of different style of power pop than what Big Star do. Uh, I mean, if you want a nice little emblematic piece of that influence, the follow-up to this record was titled 13, which is the name of Big Star's biggest song. So yeah, a lot of Alex Chilton influence thoroughly imbued in this. And I mean, speaking of Alex Chilton, replacements influence as well. You can see yeah, borrowing another, into this as well. Definitely. And so, I think replacements definitely in a lot of the just ridiculously sentimental hard on sleeve lyrics across this mm -hmm. yeah absolutely and i would say what's cool about it is that it fuses a lot of sonically where alternative rock was at in the late 80s early 90s with the like a leathered and distortion resonant tones really kind of highly melodic stuff with also shades of like 60s rock bands like the birds for instance or the kinks even or like that sort of folkier rockier aesthetic that power pop originally in the 70s emerged out of so yeah swirling melting pot of influences that kind of feed into the sound of this record and make it sort of as unique as it is and so that was something that was fun to discover when I listened to this. I, I think it's interesting we look back on it too. It's sort of like a culmination of a lot of different things at the time. Um, but when I listened to it as somebody who was approaching it as like a complete outsider, I think it's inevitable we get to this point as the things, you know, 1991 retrospective, we can talk about the things that led us there, but also the things that it would later go on to influence. And I think that uh, like a lot of things Tyler talked about, like the influence of the 60s, uh, power pop and uh, like and all these different things inevitably would like bubble to the surface in the late 90s and early 2000s, notably with something that like, this is the biggest comparison that I kept going back to with this, with uh, Weezer actually. This, I mean, I, I feel like the Blue Album basically owes most of its existence to this and I mean, naturally Rick Ocasek, but you know, in a more of a spiritual sense than a he produced it sense. No, totally. Uh, Weezer, like the guitars here are just point, so like they're so Weezer, they're so fucking Pinkerton, they're so fucking blue. It's it's not as like polished as blue, it's definitely rougher, kind of like Pinkerton, but it's undeniably the, the same DNA. Yeah, I mean, good, good shout because Weezer are, of course, the biggest power pop band of the 90s, so mm -hmm. it, it, it's inescapable. And yeah, I hadn't even clicked with Weezer and that's a really like obvious point of direct influence here where you can see this sound like rubbing off on its immediate influences. Who would admittedly develop it in a way that's kind of a bit more dynamic and a bit more varied than what Teenage Fan Club do on this record? And I'm sure that we all probably have similar sort of critiques of this album. Um, which are kind of my sort of primary critique is that it's very sort of samey and it very much mm. introduces a very kind of yeah sound that's very influential and important but also quite homogenous across the record itself that a lot of the contemporaries of Teenage Fan Club would infuse with a little more personality and idiosyncrasy than I think this band has but that said, and I'm sure that we'll get more into that as we go because I don't want to front load this video with too much of the critiques but that said there is still a kind of a nice simplicity and a kind of joyful power in how emphatically everyone on this record performs, even if they're performing in quite the simple way. Like the record is stacked with these really like beautifully cascading guitar solos and just really lovely melodies as well. Um, I, I have to bring up uh, the opening track, the concept, which is oh, by, yeah, this, by this is far one. my favorite song on this record. I and I think no probably we weren't going to talk about this song first off, because this is just such a highlight. 
yeah I, it, it's to me it, it feels like uh, the like I, again this is the only teenage fan club record i've heard but this feels like the teenage fan club song it certainly feels like the purest and most i guess both exciting and focused and fun and beautiful distillation of everything they're trying to do on this album into this kind of seven minute track that is essentially divided into these two halves right first half much more sort of standard power pop development it is really beautiful and it has these leather it introduces the sort of layers of distortion that define the band's sound over top of those really nice melodies um and then you just get that second half of the song which is just so gorgeous you have the guitars crooning you have these strings layered across it and again this really heart-rending solo that just kind of stretches across the rest of the song it's a really striking beginning to the album i think Mm. oh yeah absolutely it's a wild song i mean it's just sort of like like it's it's one of the few songs on here and this isn't like to like i, I don't want to like demean the rest of the songs here because but you're right the whole album does can contain a lot of like elemental simplicity that i think is charming and, and exciting in a lot of ways but it's one of the songs on here i could truly call ambitious uh in a way that's like actually like really really engaging and kind of fulfills itself uh it, it's it's just a good rock song yeah yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Oh god. It's it's also just such on that same note, Jake. And just a song that feels immediately classic when you hear it. Totally. I mean, from the subject matter of the track itself to just that hazy distortion, guitar distortion heavy opening. And then as the track's core melody builds up to that guitar solo, it is it's it's just structured in such like, yeah, this geniusly simple, immediately apparent, but exciting and yet ambitious way. It's such a fun opener. And to have like this six minute opener on a pop album is I think incredibly commendable when nothing else really reaches this, uh, not much else really strives to reach this, uh, level of length aside from like alcohol a day later on in the album mm. yeah yeah another aspect of the record that struck me um just more broadly as i was listening to this multiple times this week was how the i guess power pop distortion uk wave that this band represents kind of works as like a, not opposition necessarily but kind of like a counterpoint to some of the more I guess grittier and harder edged British rock music that was happening at this time like Manic Street Preachers for instance it's kind of like the flip side to that sonic aesthetic and um yeah I, I, that's not I don't really have any much more to say on that thought beyond that but it just struck me how you had these two various ways in which British rock bands in the alternative world were splitting into different sort of directions and then with the Britpop wave that was to come you would have bands sort of taking elements from both sides of the equation like Blur and Oasis and Pulp and whatever and then melding that into something more radio friendly. It's really interesting I think to see how uh, the sound of British rock music in the alternative in the popular world was developing in real time during their early 90s in these different ways. Yeah, and I, I think you make that. I think what you're saying there is a very great point about this kind of softer edge this album has. And I think that's also part of the reason to tie it back into the uh, time period itself, why that never mind uh why this album beating out never mind was such an upset because you've got mm -hmm. something that's far more measured for and far more i guess just typically like some it doesn't feel like something you would say is the best album of the year 
how I how I would think of it is and I don't mean this I don't mean I'm going to use a word and I don't mean it in a political sense but this is kind of like a conservative album in a certain sense like relative to Nevermind you have and I think what really struck people about that was that Nevermind was in the public consciousness this kind of album that represented a rebellion that represented an uprising of the youth whereas this is kind of what represents something more I suppose uh, less bold less wild less kind of like in your face although you know it's very distorted and loud so I don't know but like I I think maybe people might have have been affected to a certain extent because this is a time where like culture is ever present so people might have been affected Mm -hmm. to a certain extent by perceived target audiences of records like never mind as for the kind of like to embattled battle tortured like jocks or whatever and i know that's not true but like in perception hmm. and then bandwagon s is like for the wimps and the nerds <laughs> and that sort of thing and i, I that sounds a bit facile and stupid that the, sounds a bit facile and nev- stupid but the never mind chad versus the bandwagon s <laughs> virgin <laughs> I know, but that, that, that to me, like when I think about these two albums, the I think first about, thing I've said this video, I, I think about why people might have been upset about that spin magazine choice is to me, like these albums culturally, at least when I listen to them, seem to be appealing to different sorts of audiences. And yes. depending on yeah. what you engage with, kind of, I, I imagine in 1991 would have said something about you as a person or as a magazine personally or, yeah if if i have to zero in on something that we well i mean we have touched on kind of like how the album sounds though is that personally i want to ask uh the resident guitar snob morgan how exactly this album sounds to your ears because i'm actually kind of curious to see if like i know that we're all not like super over the moon about this uh, or or anything but i'm curious to see as to what like things that we as more modern listeners might zero in on just because it is so attached to that sort of like cultural thing that Tyler's speaking of that I think that it in a way has kind of suffered in some respects in that sort of like being so divorced from that culture is perhaps why people don't talk about this album as much as they would talk about you know a bad motor finger when they talk about records from 1991 so uh please uh enlighten me yeah it's it's interesting this is a bit of an irritation that i have with a lot of english records or just uk records i guess you would say um from around this time and that the guitars are quite loud and very distorted but they also seem pretty thin uh to me and that's not something that i in particular enjoy ever i'll take my massive ass oasis records thank you um i i think that we both sort of fall into that kind of like i know we both sort of have a um even though we didn't get to fully flesh out our opinions on something like never mind if we can zero in on that comparison that the spin magazine made is that honestly like you know not to simplify them down to this one aspect but if like I have roughly the same affinity for both but I would say I do narrowly prefer something like never mind purely because I do find the instrumental presence a bit more compelling in that respect because I do find the thinness to be a bit of a turnoff here Mm -hmm. personally I I would I would agree but I also think the records serve entirely different purposes Mm. totally absolutely yeah if I could ring up a reference point we could talk about this album in the context of jangle pop right because that's a big aspect Mm. Ah, yes and yeah, like, much better morgan how do you think it because it, it, I, I think the brittleness that you talked about is like kind of a coreness a core aspect of like jangle pop to a certain extent but obviously various different guitarists will and sort of sound people will make it sound different like so what is it how do, how do you think this record compares in sound to like other jangle pop records yeah um like i don't know i mean it feels unfair to pick this band because they're like the titans of jangle pop but like rem for instance rem was the first I, think, oh, I mean them. jesus um well for one thing <laughs> rem would never distort their guitars this much um, no. that's true that's true um so it's that's and that thing. and that's already part of the problem i think is that the sound has not transitioned far enough from 
Django Pop for the guitar choices to entirely make sense to me. Like, it feels like they're taking mm-hmm. a Django Pop rig and setup and just smacking a big old overdrive pedal on it. And it doesn't 100% work. I don't know. That might be, that's something that could just as easily be the appeal of this record as it could be an irritation. What, what, another thought I had listening to this like, that I couldn't get away from is that it felt almost wrong to be listening to this like on an MP3 on a yeah, computer. Right. Like I felt like I should be listening to this on a cassette tape and like analog a, and, something. and yeah, like specifically like this is, this feels like a mixtape band in the sense that you would mm-hmm. pick a song off this record and it'll be an amazing choice to put on a mixtape with a bunch of other like early nineties alt rock acts uh, and just make that mixtape for yourself or for someone else or whatever. It just feels like this is, and, and that, this could sound demeaning. I don't mean it in a demeaning way, but Teenage Fan Club to me, at least based on this record, seemed like one of those perfect mixtape bands. And I think that is not a negative at all. Like if you can be one of those bands that is able to produce just gems, even if they're not, you know, consistently wall to wall, your album isn't consistently wall to wall, great ones, but each person will come away and like have a particular song that resonates with them and and yeah and it just has this whole feel and sound and it's like I feel like I'm not getting the full you know impact of this because I wasn't able to experience it in that era or in that way which is you know yeah Yeah, I mean I I find it interesting that that might be demeaning because you know who is like the best mixtape band ever is like the Smiths. I was gonna I say, was fucking gonna yeah. say. Oh, yeah. well, actually, we were yeah. all gonna say it. The Smiths yeah. are the Smiths are another good reference point because at least unlike uh, uh-huh. REM, they're British, and so it's like you have something a little bit closer to home to see as an as a reference point on this. And we've talked about all the reference points that take from this, but like the Smiths are a big reference point on this, and oh, as definitely. as undeniably good as teenage fan club are and i really like the guitars on this record particularly the soloing um i will say that they don't have a johnny ma and the reason that the smiths are one of the greatest bands of the 80s regardless of what you think about morrissey i know that smith's discourse is is all but completely subsumed by morrissey discourse now which i kind of hate but whatever we 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 can't simply not have morrissey discourse on here this regardless of what you think the smiths and johnny ma specifically one of the great guitarists of the 80s at least within the i mean no i think just generally one of the greatest guitarists of the 80s and particularly within the alternative world like his his sound is was pioneering and oh yeah yeah and so, yeah, you can see it, it almost feels unfair to, to compare a band like Teenage Fan Club to them. But then this is it. We don't have, like, we have to have reference points. And they do come off looking a little bit, you know, lackluster by comparison. I, and I, I think rather than taking that as a negative, I think it can be, it can be then turned around to a positive to speak to just the singularity of this band and why that yes. homogeneity is so, I guess, integral to how this album is uh, exists as a whole mm. in that it, while there's the only other thing that sounds like these songs is every other song on this album, which mm. is kind of, yeah, the problem here. But there is one element of this uh album i really want to highlight and that's the drumming which i think is by and large really solid really exceptional from brendan o'hare a name uh you may be familiar with from a band called mogwai and their debut album oh Oh, shit the scott strike again (laughs) yeah i've done it but a and I, I need to highlight his contributions because I think they are just absolutely solid on this album. And if there's and I think the punchiness of the drums, what I think does elevate parts of this album, uh, definitely. I, yeah. I quite like their presence. Yeah, no, that's a good shout. And I hadn't I knew I recognized the name Brendan O'Hare, but I hadn't associated it with Magua Young team. Um, yeah, no, good shout. And I will say that even though I think the concept stands head and shoulders above 
the other songs in this record for me. There are still other tracks here that I think are highlights, and I'll be curious to see if you all have the similar, the same highlights as me or different highlights. But I also really dig, um, well, actually, most of, I really dig the last sort of stretch of this record. Um, like songs like Sidewinder, I find to be really beautiful, and Alcoholiday, especially, I think is a real standout. Um, again, just where that real sort of detailed and heavy sort of guitar playing really comes to the fore in a really really strong way i think i think the concept is solid but my favorite song on here is actually is this music yeah i was Um, gonna get to that that's a great that's like it's because it's fucking wild this song is just like like it it almost feels like it's too off the rails to even be called um uh ambitious like uh, some of the other songs on here could be labeled is that this is just the band just being fucking whoa (laughs) and it just really blew me away after this album of like you know it has its you know more its moments where it sort of aims a little bit higher but you know it you settle into a really nice groove by the end of the album and then it just comes around just really I was just like, wow, this is something that I feel like the the band, you know, theoretically, I could listen to other albums from them down the line if they had made more music like this that's a little bit more unhinged. This sounds cool as fuck. Yeah. Uh, on that note of, like, closing songs that I really love, oh, fuck, I love Guiding Stars. Yes! Such Me a too. great penultimate oh. track. It is Me so... Too. It's, like, so... I love just how drenched in reverb it is because it makes it just so ethereal and outwardly pretty in such a unique way. It, I it, love that. I, I, I thought I was going to be the only person writing for that song. It has these gorgeous string parts in it. Ah. I, I can't quite tell exactly what it is, whether it's like a cello or some kind of like bassy string instrument. It's really like gorgeous and it adds this really beautiful texture to the song that none of the other songs on the record have. And it's just, yeah, really like that last four tracks or especially the last three tracks really stand out to me as a strong um, section of music. And also like shout out to December as well, which uh, earlier in the record, which I really like too. That song has a really neat little bass lick that it's rooted in that I think is really, really nice. And again, you have violins adding an extra flavor at certain points in that song. And the string contributions in general, I think are easy to overlook, but they are one of the more unique flavors that this record has that elevated above just, you know, a couple of dudes with guitars cranking up the distortion pedal. Like it's, there are these other elements like the strings that do give it some added texture that I think the record benefits from having. I think there's Mm. some songs near the middle here too that I actually like, I'll stick up for the uh, Star Sign, Metal Baby and Pet Rock or- Yeah, Star Sign. Yeah, I, I think that stretch of songs is like the band's like capitalizing on what they do best in my opinion the album takes like a little bit to settle into like once it gets to like like sort of I'm not as hot on something like December but I will say that like uh I do like it but something like uh Satan and what you do to me don't exactly hit me as uh some of the shining moments of the this particular record but that's when it really hits a stride for me what you do to me I think has a really nice hook like it, it got stuck yeah. in my head really, really easily. Um, yeah. But the, it's just a bit of an underdeveloped song. I wish yes, that that I song were a bit longer and a bit more kind of fleshed out because I love the hook on that track. It's just, yeah. Same I, with Satan. It doesn't really feel like a song. Oh, it, yeah. It, Satan really just m- messes the fucking album up after that great yeah, opening after, track. I don't know yeah. why they put that on there. Again, it's like the, the gulf in how worked on certain songs feel on this record is yeah. really large. Is that my problem with what you do to me is that it makes that fucking plain white tease song play in my head, which is the <laughs> one of the worst fucking songs to ever be a hit. Why? <laughs> why did we? Why? Why did we allow that? Why did we allow the plain white tease? Who? Why would you Enough. call? Why would you call yourself the plain white tease as a band? You're just inviting yeah, because they're committed to being fucking embarrassing. They're just committed to being fucking bland in every respect, including the name. Objectively a terrible band name. Yeah. No, there's no... <laughs> Objectively a terrible band. Got him. Anyway. Andy. <laughs> Booyah! Remove that.
I, I definitely think that the uh, the point of just how worked on song, song, certain songs feel is just the heart of the matter in terms of the just vast quality disparity between this album's best and, and worst moments. Uh, one thing I would say, though, I think that even though we may not be the most hot on this album, I think it is something that people should listen to primarily because there is so much that that just uh, kind of rise and fall of quality i think inevitably means that there is going to be at least one track on here yeah you really really dig and really love and you'll probably find a lot of other music that you like too through it i mean like the best thing i can go for here is the replacements who even at their like their lesser essential songs still feel like like something like on let it be like i think i would mark the i have this album at a 10 out of 10 so nobody's gonna come after me for this is that i think like the least essential song on that album would be like gary's got a boner which is still a fucking awesome song it yeah. rules it still feels like they slaved over like the little details in that song which yeah. aren't quite as refined here you know yeah it's the difference between something like that that is undoubtedly similar yeah I, I think to be fair we've been a lot kinder to this record than we've been to other records that we've been middling on um which is a testament to totally. its influence and importance but i have a recommendation actually for people who enjoy this kind of mm. thing uh a record from the same year and the same sort of niche that i think is better than this one uh, and this is a record that actually uh spencer our friend spencer got me onto a while ago which is matthew sweet's album girlfriend oh yeah uh, yes i love that album yeah completely that, agree that album is also a 1991 record also a power pop sort of noisy but it's just mm. slightly more overlooked than this one which sucks because yeah. it's an album that's much more ambitious and varied than this one like it, it has a it lot has of different... really good songwriting too yeah. I, I think the hooks on that album are just fucking second to none yeah so if you like this record or if you like this aesthetic but you want to try something that's a little more i guess uh, ambitious or maybe more uh, consistent on the whole then well I don't know maybe it's maybe the Matthew Sweet record is less consistent but it just does its ideas a bit more ambitiously in a way that appeals to me but anyway if that sounds interesting to you definitely check out that album it's really good um, and yeah Matthew that's... Sweet also uh, known for his Scooby-Doo theme song cover really yes that he uh, <laughs> he did a covered the scooby-doo theme and it's not bad i'll say (laughs) amazing wow well on that note on that note favorite tracks and ratings where are you he's also um a nebraskan artist based in omaha he is i uh, yeah my parents have I, I don't know if they've met him, but I know they have quite a couple of your, uh, your, your parents, uh, George Bush and <laughs> my parents, yeah, George Bush and Osama bin Laden. <laughs> <laughs> really progressive of them. Yeah. Uh, okay. Favorite tracks and ratings. Well, it's like I leave this show for a fucking second. <laughs> I didn't I didn't hear uh, any of it. Good. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> uh, three favorite tracks on here definitely got to be is this music the concept and uh, I'll say I'm, uh, I like the song the unfortunately titled pet rock just because it kind of goes um, least favorite song is yeah it's Satan kind of throws a wrench in the pacing of the first part of the album kind of think it would be better without it and uh, yeah I give it a 6.5 nice All right. uh, my three favorites on here would have two the uh the concept star sign and guiding star the double star aesthetic going on there and uh least favorite would be yeah satan easily uh six out of ten you heard it here folks the jansd podcast not a fan of satan Get the behind me. <clears throat> Satan, um, get ye behind me! In Killer Mike's words. Um, yeah, I'm going to say my favorite tracks are Star Sign, uh, Alcoholiday, and The Concept. Um, my least favorite 
Who could it be? I just can't imagine. Who could it be? Satan. Uh, I'm gonna. I'm feeling. Got a feed out. I'm gonna give this a five and I love a half. Out of ten. A Barbie. Should you say five or five and a half, Morgan? The latter. Okay, cool. I just wonderful. My three favorite tracks are the concepts. Uh, Alcohol a day and is this music special shout out to guiding light because it was very close forth um little, little, least favorite is actually i might say i don't know i just really don't care for that song uh and i'm gonna give this album a respectable six out of ten which and that leaves us yeah with an average, average of six out of ten an average of 6.0 out of ten um so let us know at home what you think of this record, what this record means to you, what you think of Teenage Fan Club, if you have other, if you have other records you think we should check out, and what you think of the power pop, Brit pop, this whole wave of music in the early 90s in the UK. Let us know about that all in the comments below. Make sure you like and subscribe if you haven't already. Really helps us out. And next week, next same time next week, we'll be back with the very last installment in the 1991 retrospective where we wrap it all up by talking about the titan that is My Bloody Valentine's Loveless. Right. And as always, folks, rock over London, rock on Chicago, National Geographic, live curious. <laughs>